song we just sang, the old rugged cross, the cross, the cross, the cross. What is it with the cross? Um, why, why this fixation with the cross? Uh, the cross, as you know, it's, it's been um, an identifying symbol for Christians. I, I would guess even more popular than that little fish that you put on the back of your car. Unless you're a very rude driver, then I suggest maybe you don't. <laughs> um, it's been an identifying symbol for Christians, the cross, and you'll see many times there's church buildings that feature the cross very prominently. The cross has kind of become a, it's become an icon, it's become a fashion statement. Some of you, I have this, there's this great t-shirt by a great designer that's got the cross with a period. The cross is it, it is a statement. Um, it's become a fashion statement, there's cross necklaces, you see a lot of those. Right? People wear it to proclaim their faith, to show people, I believe in Jesus. So, what's so special about the cross? This Sunday, being the first Sunday of the month, we continue our tradition of studying a hymn or a worship song. And as you know, sometimes we study the life of the songwriter, the life of the author of the hymn. Sometimes you look at the particular circumstances, what happened in that person's life that inspired that hymn. Sometimes we just like to take a closer look at the song so that we know what we're singing. It's always good to look at the theology, the doctrine, the truths that are being proclaimed in the song. Because otherwise you're just, you don't know what you're singing. And so it's always good to know what we're singing. Um, and so today we're going to take a look at this, at this hymn we just sang, The Old Rugged Cross. Now this hymn was written by a gentleman by the name of George Benner. And he was a minister, he was an evangelist. And the story goes that in 1912, so over 100 years ago, in 1912 he was uh, on, on a circuit, he was preaching, and he was at this revival meeting in Michigan and he was preaching there. And what happened, according to legend, is as he was preaching, apparently there was a group of teenagers who kept on heckling him. I don't know what they were saying, you know, get off the stage, Mr. Bennett, or we want to hear something more exciting. I, I don't know what was going on, but they were heckling him, booing him, and he was not personally offended, but what really struck his heart, what really made him sad was their disregard for the gospel. Because as an evangelist, he's preaching, he's preaching, and he's talking about Jesus and the cross, what Jesus means for us, his salvation. And he was really sad that these youths were so um, rude toward the gospel, having a total disregard for it. And so after the meeting, he meditated on Jesus, he meditated on the cross, and the first verse came to him. He was inspired to pen this first verse. And then over the course of the next, I can't remember, maybe a year or so, he completed the rest of the hymn. And in 1913, a year later, it was performed in public for the first time and apparently it caught on. It's become one of the more popular hymns. Um, one website I was looking at said it's the most popular hymn. I don't know. I think Amazing Grace is a lot more well known. I think a lot more people know it. But this, this one breaks up there. A lot of people know the old rugged cross. And so what I want to do this morning is to come and take a look at the lyrics that we were just singing. So if, um, you don't need your Bibles yet, but with your program sheet, your bulletin, turn with me and look at the verses, uh, look at the words for the old rugged cross. We'll start with verse one, all right? Right in the beginning, George Bennett here, he's painting a picture with his words. Right? I don't know if you've done this when you sing, but when I sing this song, I picture that there is a hill far away, and there is this old rugged cross. And I don't know if you've worked with wood. Most of you know that I like to work with wood. There's new wood, and there's old wood. Old wood, rugged wood, it's, it's been weathered. It's been out in the sun. The, the color's been bleached out of it. It's perhaps got splits and splinters. Right, so this picture I have in my head right away is painted and old and rugged. This thing is strong. This cross standing on the hill far away. It's the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. We look at the cross. When we look at the cross, we consider the cross as a symbol of glory. But it is not a symbol of glory. You gotta take out one letter from that word glory. Take out the L. It is a symbol of glory. 
right? Most of you know what happens on the cross. Most of you know what happens at the crucifixion. It is not a pretty sight. It's, it's an emblem of suffering and shame, the second line says, right? It's, it's a picture of suffering and of shame. When people are crucified on there, it's not pretty. It's a slow, painful death that comes by asphyxiation. You run out of air, you can't breathe anymore. You're too weak to prop yourself up to breathe. And so you die, and, and you're suffocating, you die. And so it's, it's an ugly, ugly thing. And then, so you're thinking about the suffering and the shame, and then right in the next line, George Bennett writes, and I love that old cross. Right? So I don't know, as we sing this song, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, why in the world would we love the cross? Because you need, you need to think about what's happening on the cross, what it's used for, right? We need to think about, look, it's, it was an instrument of punishment. It was an instrument of ex execution, right? Today, this morning, if instead, I led us to sing, uh, just, just, just imagine, uh, and I love, in a room far away, sat an old electric chair for executing criminals. And I love that old chair, right? You would be looking at me like, you're kind of sick. Why would you love an electric chair? Well, look, the cross was no different. It was a tool used for executing criminals. Right? And so you wouldn't sing about loving an electric chair. You wouldn't sing about loving lethal injection. So why are we singing about the cross? Right? You, you need to think about it. Um, look, we, this cross, this cross, the next line says, I love that old cross because this is where the dearest and best. Who's the dearest and best? Jesus. Jesus Christ himself. He died for a world of lost sinners. Right? So we don't love the cross for the cross itself. We don't love the cross because the cross was a cruel instrument. But we love what Jesus did on the cross, that he went there to die for a world of lost sinners. That's us. We are the lost sinners. Jesus died for us on the cross. And that's why we would say that we love this old cross. Verse 2. Verse 2 says, Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. Right? So, so he's now painting a picture of how the world sees this cross. It is despised by the world. Why is it despised by the world? Because criminals hang on them. Right? If you imagine these are the worst of the worst people, people who have done terrible things, who have hurt people, who have killed people, people who are being punished for heinous crimes, they are hanging on these crosses. And so when you think of the cross, you despise the people on there because these are people that have hurt society. These are people that have wronged humanity. And so the world, the world when it thinks about the cross, this is where criminals are executed. And so people that were hated, they hang on the cross. So when you walk by, it's not just a punishment, but it was a, a form of public mockery, right? Look at this criminal. Look at what he did to us. And they would often hang signs above them to detail what their crimes were. Look at this person. And we caught him, and people would spit at them. People would mock them, openly mock them. It was a tool of not just punishment, but to be despised by people walking by. And yet, and yet, George Bennett writes, and yet this cross that is despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. Why, why is it a wondrous attraction? I looked up the word wondrous. It means inspiring a feeling of wonder or delight. Right, again, a, a very strange juxtaposition of something that's despised, yet would inspire delight or wonder. Why, again, why, why is this? It's, what is it about this cruel instrument of execution that's despised by the world that would inspire a feeling of wonder or delight? What is it that draws me to it? 
What draws me to this instrument of death? Because the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to come and to be hung on that despised cross. Right? And so I think, if you, if you think about this, I think it's a little bit more wonder than delight. Delight's a little bit weird, but I think there is an element of wonder when you think about how could it be, how could it be that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ Himself, God Himself, the Son of God, why is it, how could it, that He would leave His glory behind? Right? Because when He is in heaven, He is worshipped. Why would He leave all that behind and come and spend 33 and a half years in our midst, living in these sinful bodies, being confined by his humanity. Why would he do that? And it, it would inspire wonder in us. And it, it's hard enough that he had to live as a man to, to have to contain himself in sinful flesh. And it's something beyond comprehension or understanding, right? When we try to think about it, we, we get it, right? We've preached on this before. Jesus came and he lived in the flesh. I think we all know that. It is the fact that we have digested and we have come to understand as a truth. But sometimes there are truths that you have learned to accept that you still can't wrap your mind around. And therein lies the wonder, how in the world did this happen? That Jesus himself would come and be a man and live as a man and then want to when he would look forward to, right? It, it, the Bible tells us he had his face set toward Jerusalem. He was looking forward steadfast to that death on the cross. He was a man on a mission. Why in the world would anyone want to do this? And we know the facts of it, but it's not something that I at least will claim to understand. It, it's something that still overwhelms me when I think about it. Right? Verse 3, verse 3. In the old broken cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see, for twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify you. When you look at a blood-stained tree, right? I want you to picture that, a blood-stained tree. How do you see beauty in that? I don't know, but this verse tells us that there is a wondrous beauty that I see, and it's not a pretty picture. It's not a pretty picture. And I would say we should never, ever sanitize what happened on the cross. We should never, ever disregard the suffering. We should never, ever disregard the pain and the, the gore of what happened on there. Not to glorify it, but if we kind of clean that up and make it a G-rated version, then we take away a lot of what Jesus went through for us. Right? We cannot sanitize the cross, but on that cross we can see beauty not in what Jesus went through, not in the, the physical sufferings, but we see the beauty of what he did for me. Right? His suffering, his death, what did it do? It brought me pardon and it brought me sanctification. What is pardon? I'm forgiven. I am forgiven because He took my place. Uh, that was supposed to be my place, in that place of judgment, the wrath of God coming down upon me. Jesus took my place and He died on that cross so that I could be pardoned. And He bled so that my sins would be washed away. So what He did there, as gruesome as it is, there is beauty in it because of the pardon and the sanctification that He has brought for me. And so we need to see the beauty of what Jesus did. And now we come to verse 4. Verse 4. To the old rugged cross then, to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then He'll call me someday to my home far away, where His glory forever I'll share. Right? After considering the cross and what it is and what happened on there and why Jesus did it and what that means to us and looking at the beauty of it all, it is now time in this last verse to come and respond. 
right? And what is our response? Our response is to say that I will be true to the cross. What does that mean to be true to the cross? It's easy to say it, but we need to think about what that looks like in our lives to be true to the cross. I will not deny the cross. Sometimes, sometimes, and I don't know if you do this, I hope not, but sometimes we're embarrassed to share that we are a Christian. The cross being, being our identity, we kind of hide it around people. We don't want people to know that we're Christians. To be true to the cross, I will not be embarrassed by it. I will not reject the cross. And we, we talked about this recently, that there has recently been Christian leaders who have come out and rejected Jesus and rejected what he did on the cross. No, we need to be true to the cross as a response of what Jesus did for us. And I will not nullify the need for the cross. That's how I can be true to the cross. If we come and say that I am not a sinful person, if we come and say, look, okay, maybe I'm bad, but I do some good and it balances out, what you're saying is then there was no need for the cross. Jesus died for nothing because you could have fixed your problems. And that is not being true to the cross. Being true to the cross is to understand at the heart of it, there was a desperate need by mankind for salvation because we could not fix ourselves. As much as we would like to try, we can't fix ourselves. I don't know what your problems are. I think I would prefer not to know what your problems are sometimes. But if we are honest with ourselves, as we continue to follow Christ, we find that we still struggle with some parts of ourselves that we just can't leave behind. That's why we need the cross and the work of the cross. Never, ever say there's not a need. There will always be a need for the cross. So how do I gladly bear the shame and reproach of the cross then? What is the shame and reproach of the cross? I think that I was thinking about this this week. The shame and reproach of the cross when we think about it. Many times when I sing this song, I think of the external aspect of shame and reproach where when people see me and see my identity in the cross and see my belief, my faith, and see that I'm a Christian, there sometimes may be reproach. There sometimes may be shame and derision cast upon me. And I, I hopefully would gladly bear that for the cross. But I think that there's something else about this shame and reproach, right? Because when we think about the cross, what does having a need for the cross say about us? It tells us that we are not whole. It tells us that we are broken. It tells us that, that as as hard as we try to be good, as hard as we try to fix all our problems, there's still something that we couldn't deal with. Right? So when we come and we are faced with the necessity of the cross, when we understand the necessity of the cross, when you turn it around, it reflects on us. And there, there is the aspect of, it, it reveals to me when I understand that I need the cross, it reveals to me the shame of my sins. And it opened my eyes to the reproach or the disapproval of my sins. Does that make sense? In looking at the cross and understanding the need for it, I start to see something about myself. And, and it, it really paints a picture for us. When we look at the cross and we, when we look at who it was that died on the cross, it really paints a picture of what a great price that was paid. And when we look at the great price that was paid, it magnifies the wrong that needed to be set right. You know, sometimes, sometimes when someone makes a great mistake, out of gentleness, out of compassion, out of mercy, you know, we try to not point it out. Um, there's been plenty of times I've, I've made very terrible mistakes. And Alice, in her gentleness, has decided not to bring it up. I, I remembered earlier this year, 
I was late paying our property taxes. And I don't know how many of you understand what property taxes are. So you, if you own a house, you have to pay the government taxes. And every year, I think in February and October, you have to turn in taxes. But they give you two months, so you can wait until April 10th or December 10th to mail in your taxes. And if that tax payment is not submitted or stamped by April 10th or December 10th, it is late and you pay a 15% late fee, which when you think about how much property taxes are, it's a lot of money. And so this April, I thought I paid it already. And, and you, you know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes there's a feeling in you, Jason, double check, double check, triple check. Ah, oh, I paid it back in January. Okay, April 10th was the deadline. April 10th passes. April 15th, filed regular taxes. Went back to put my paperwork away and, oh, here is my property tax bill that I did not pay. Oh, dear. And, yeah, made a big mistake and it cost an arm and a leg. And I, I remember I was terribly, terribly upset with myself because that was a lot of money. And I remember, you know, I was screaming inside, but you know, I tried to calm myself down and told Alice about it. Bless her heart. Well, okay, it happened. Just, you know, come December, remember. The, the December to remember, right? Oh, she, you know, she didn't rub it in. She, she didn't point out the cost of my mistake. She could have. She could have. She had every right, because this is our money. That's not my money, it's our money. She could have said, Oh, you know what, Jason? You know how much food I could have bought? You know how many ribeye steaks she just threw in the trash? Right? And she could have pointed it out. And when she does that, I would have to bear that shame, that guilt, that, that wrong that I committed. And I would be weighing, it would be weighing down on me. Right? And that's what I'm talking about. When we look at the cross, it reflects on us. And that great price opened our eyes to see exactly why I needed the cross. And that light shines on me and I see what a great sinner I am. And so there is shame, there is reproach. Why would I gladly bear that? Because in bearing that, I acknowledge that I am a mess and that I need Jesus. You see how everything is circuitous? Everything goes around and comes around and all ties together. We need the cross because we are a mess. I'll, I'll use I just so you don't feel terrible. I need the cross because I am a mess. I am a mess, therefore I need the cross. And because I am a mess, I know I need the cross. And when I need the cross, I know that I'm a mess. And it just goes and goes and goes. It's a perfect circle. But we need to bear that shame and reproach because if I deny it, if I say, you know what? Okay, okay, Jesus died for me and my sins. It says it in the Bible, we have to say that or else Jesus will stop talking about it. But my sins aren't so bad. That's just, just a little bit, you know, I just have a little bit of sin. No, your sinful nature is so wretched that it separated you from God, right? And so we need to bear the weight of that. And as we bear it, then we know where to bring it to the cross, right? So we need to bear that shame and reproach gladly. That's a shame and that's a reproach, right? It's, it's, it's that giant neon sign hanging over my head. We all have one. Every one of us has a giant neon sign flashing, sinner, 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 right? It's a reminder to us of what we need because again, I don't ever want to forget the price that Jesus paid for my salvation. I don't ever want to forget that. I don't want to forget that what he did to erase my sin to cover my shame and reproach because that's his gentle forgiveness, his mercy and his love for me. Which is why then, as we consider why Jesus did all this for us and his mercy that covers our sins, as we sing it, then we respond with this. We come to the chorus. In your, in your bulletins, it's the purple italic words. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. If I ever, if I ever think that I have managed to accomplish something on my own to save myself, if 
I ever think that I have somehow made myself a better person. If I ever think that there is some good in me that could save me, come back to the cross. Come back to the cross and cherish the cross. We need to cherish the cross because this is our reminder. Cherish this old rugged cross that always reminds me of who I am. Cherish it until I lay my trophies down. Right? All those little trophies. I don't, I don't know how many of you have trophies. If you ever uh, go with me to visit my parents' house down in Irvine, um, actually maybe they threw it away already, but in, in what used to be my room, I had a shelf with trophies. Uh, participation trophies mostly. Uh, but there were some that where I won awards. Uh, one was for a Bible quiz team that I joined. Uh, I think I got runner up for rookie of the year. But anyways, I, I had my, my, my trophies and I was I was proud of them. I like looking at them. In our life as a Christian, sometimes we start to gather up trophies. I've done something great. I, I've you know I've come so far. I've got almost perfect attendance at Bible study. I, I, I don't know, I, I've done this, I've done that, I've accomplished this, and we start to rack up trophies, right? And what do we start to look at now? Our eyes are on the trophies and not on the cross. Cherish that old rugged cross. Let it remind you of who you are until you are able to lay these trophies down. Otherwise, these trophies become an idol for you. They, be, they become your salvation, which they are not. So cherish the old rugged cross until you can lay your trophies down. Right? Well, what trophies do we have? Like I mentioned, you know, sometimes, yeah, I don't lose my temper as often anymore. Father of the year, he doesn't lose his temper so much. Right? All, all these things that we think, lay it down and cling to the cross until one day, until one day, not because of any merit of yours, not because of anything you've done, but only by the work that was done on the cross, you would receive a crown of glory. That's what those last two lines mean. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Now this is not the crown that, we're speak, that, that the Bible speaks of where you receive a crown for what you have done and then you, you, you cast your crown back to the Lord to, to, to glorify it. No, this is a crown of salvation, of entering into salvation. That crown can only come by the cross. Nothing else can be exchanged for the crown of salvation. And so cling to the cross, cling to the cross, and remember, none of these trophies are worth anything because it's only the cross that will bring you into salvation. And we need, we need, this is what I want to end with this morning, we need to recognize, we need to recognize that there is power in the cross. What do I mean by that? What power? This is the power of the death of Jesus. His death and in our faith in believing unto him and being baptized, we die with him. There is power in that. There is power against our sinful flesh. By the power of the cross, we can daily die to ourselves. There is something about what Jesus did on the cross and our being part of that death that slowly does away with our nature, our old nature. There is power in that. Now, the power when we talk about, you have to understand, it is not about the power of God an object, right? It's not about the physical cross itself, right? And if you ima imagine, imagine today if news came out of the Middle East, archaeologists have unearthed at the burial site of Jesus a shard of preserved wood believed to be part of the cross that Jesus died on. Can you imagine the frenzy that would overtake much of the world. We found a piece of the cross that Jesus was crucified on. There is power in the cross, so if I hold that piece of cross, I will be healed. No, I, okay, look. 
If, if that were to happen, if we were able to somehow prove that we found a piece of wood that was a piece of the cross that Jesus died on, that's special. That is very special. That means a lot. But that piece of wood, if we look at the scriptures at least, that piece of wood has no power. It's, it's, it's something very significant, I think. And I would think, you know, if, if somehow I could get to see it, I would love to, but I would understand touching it would do nothing. Right? So like, I am so holy now. No, there is, when, when you look at the Bible, any time that somebody touched something and something happened to them, it was not by the object, but it was by their faith. Right? Remember the, the Syrophoenician woman who touched the hem of Jesus and her, her blood flow stopped? By the power of my garment, you have been healed. No, by your faith, because you believe that touching my garment you will receive my power. By your faith, that woman was healed. It is our faith in what Jesus did on the cross that saves us, not the actual physical cross itself. And, and this is the thing, this is the, something we have to take to heart. We can't put our faith in the outward physical things. Right, when, when, uh, we'll get to it in Bible study eventually, but in 2 Timothy, Paul warns Timothy, he says, know this. He said, know this. In the last days, perilous, perilous times will come with men having a form of godliness but denying its power. Right? People who put on what looks like godliness, who may have these objects of worship, but they deny the power of the cross. What they are putting stock in is, is an external, is what they do. You know what? You know, what did Jesus say on the cross? What was the last thing he said? Do you remember? Three words in English. It is done. It is finished. It is finished. The work of salvation. There's nothing we can add to it. There's nothing that any one of us here can do to add to the work of salvation. Jesus on the cross, he said it is finished because it was finished. It was done. And we need to put our faith in that power of what Jesus finished, not in what we can continue to try to do. And so we, we need to, we need to cherish, always, always cherish the cross. And what's been done on the cross, what's already been accomplished on the cross. Part of that is why we have breaking of bread every week. When we take the bread, when we take the cup, we remember Jesus' sacrifice. We remember what he did on the cross as part of that sacrifice. And so I hope this morning, I hope that this dwells in you. The next time we sing the old rugged cross, we we understand what a price was paid and why it is that we need to cherish that cross. And as you sing it, if, if you start to see visions of little trophies that you built up for yourselves, ask the Lord, please, help me to lay it down, help me to put these things down, and hold on to the cross and only the cross. Let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus, you finished it all on the cross. Redemption, salvation, complete, done, and free for us all to receive. I thank you for the cross. I love you for the cross. And I thank you and I love you for what you did on the cross for me. Thank you for the reminder. And thank you, Lord, for your love. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.